Shanghai, China, a massive city of 24 million. I've lived here for nearly seven years, first as an exchange student, then as a master's student, and now as a columnist and filmmaker at Shanghai Daily. It's easy to sometimes feel lost here as a foreigner, so during my months at home under the novel coronavirus outbreak, I decided to read up on a fellow New Zealander who made a huge impact here. A man who's memorialised in statues, remembered fondly by millions, and counted some of China's greatest leaders among his friends and acquaintances. Dewi achieved a lot during his long life here, from improving the lot of children working in factories to setting up schools and cooperatives and writing more than 60 books on the country. But to fully understand his China story, one needs to first understand his life in Shanghai, where he went from being a young, apolitical man seeking a new life to a humanitarian wanting to change China and the world for the better. His China journey began in this city nearly 100 years ago. It was here actually at Shiliopu, the number 16 dock, where Rewi first stepped foot on China's mainland way back on April 21, 1927. But I imagine the view was a little different back then. Shanghai in 1927 was a chaotic place, to say the least. Rewi arrived the week after what's known today as the Shanghai Massacre, when thousands of suspected communists were gathered up and executed by the KMT. Many decapitated in the streets. Some historians credit that event as the beginning of China's civil war. But Rewi was largely unaware of the political situation at the time. Dave Bromwich is president of the New Zealand-China Friendship Society, a society Rewi himself helped set up in 1952. Rui Ali always described himself as an ordinary bloke, um, but in fact he turned out to be an, a, a man of exceptional talent and extraordinary experience. When you read uh, Rewi's biography, you realise that when he first arrived in Shanghai, he wasn't a particularly political animal. Elspeth Sands, an award-winning novelist and cousin of Rewi's, agrees. No, he wasn't. I don't think he, was, he, he didn't really become political until he had to, you know, until he really had to make a choice between the nationalists and the communists. So he hadn't, he hadn't, wouldn't have seen himself as being a communist then. In fact, he, he seems to have become a communist by accident. I mean, there's, there's... Elspeth recently released a book on her cousin titled A Communist in the Family. She believes that Ewi's political awareness was honed during his 10 years in Shanghai, starting when he got a job here at the fire department of the Municipal Council of the International Settlement, just days after he arrived. It's still a key fire station, but this area is no longer governed by foreign powers. Instructor Zhang Yijie showed me around, including inside their small museum. There was a whole area here devoted to Rui Ali and his time here. So you can see how important he was as part of the Hongkou fire station. Rui's old room here at the station is now shared by six officers, including Wang Dajing. It's a bit less cramped than it was in 1979 when Rui returned to the station as part of a New Zealand documentary. Well, here we are again after 51 years since I left this room, having spent my first year here uh, learning about China. And I come into this room and look around it. Well, as you could recognize it, certainly, there's the stove we used to sit beside and have afternoon tea. Uh, the bathroom is closed off, I expect, for a general bathroom somewhere else. And here, 
are now living uh, 12 firemen in the place that one European sub-officer lived in. Soon he was promoted to the role of Chief Factory Inspector, tasked with ensuring the city's factories were up to standard. It was in this role that he began to see suffering on a daily basis. The experiences he had include atrocious working conditions, children locked in factories 12 hours a day, appalling conditions, no escape if there was a fire. But when he was a factory inspector, he really started to put the boot in. Um, He would talk to factory owners and tell them they were murderers and they were child killers. And, you know, he didn't didn't mince words. What Rewi saw during those years weighed heavily. Uh, You know, the, the, the waste of human life like that of good life, the best, uh, the best life in China uh, was fantastic in those days. Rewi was able to secure some changes in Shanghai's factories, including giving children workers better quality food, adding safety measures and ensuring medicine was available. He also witnessed um, other events from that very chaotic period. Uh, I remember one incident he recalls in his biography as of witnessing some young labourers being strung on, on poles and being carted off to an execution ground simply because they were labourers and associated with the Communist Party. It was experiences like the White Terror that pushed Rewi towards helping the Communists, which was largely while he was living here, building four 1315 UN Road from 1932 to 1937. That came about through connections he made with internationalists he met during this period who were heavily involved in the politics of it all and would ultimately help shape Rewi's future in China. People like Americans Edgar Snow and Agnes Smedley, whom he met in 1929 and 1932 respectively, as well as Joseph Bailey, who he later set up schools with across the country. This is Jing Min. She grew up in part of Rui's old house and has lived here ever since. It's been separated into several homes and is now protected as an historic building. Dave from the New Zealand China Friendship Society put me in touch with Ms. Jing, who spent much of her life researching the man whose former residence she now calls home. The people he protected from execution by the KMT mostly stayed in what is now Ms. Jung's living room. While living here, Rui also set up a radio on the rooftop to communicate with the revolutionaries about the situation in Shanghai. By 1938, Japan occupied all of Shanghai apart from the international settlement. In July, Rui left the city to start work on his gung-ho industrial cooperatives all around China which were largely aimed at moving production away from Japanese-controlled areas. This brought the Shanghai chapter of his life to an end. It's been more than a year since the COVID pandemic hit the world, and since I started delving into the life of Rewi Ali. I've been captivated by a line in Rewi's autobiography, page 236, where he says his years in a small place called Shandan were the richest and happiest of his life. I usually head back to New Zealand about once a year, but that hasn't happened with international travel restricted the way it is. 
So with annual leave up my sleeve, I decided to head to the far reaches of northwest China's Gansu province to find out more about why they really love the place so much. There are no direct flights to such an isolated place, so I stopped over on the way in Lanzhou, the capital city of Gansu. It turns out though that this city, a few hundred kilometers from Shandan, also has much of Rewi's history. This is the Lanzhou City University, which used to be the Bailey Oil School. Rewi was principal here for a short time, and he's remembered with this statue on campus. Also on campus is a Rewi Alley Museum and the Rewi Alley Research Center, with Shi Hong at the helm. This is the first time to study Rewi Alley's research and thinking. 呃，这个中心呢，主要是为了呃研究弘扬爱丽精神，嗯、呃，研究培丽文化以及爱丽思想对于我们今天的教育工作的一种指导意义啊，呃，来围绕这些来开展工作的。哇，啊，挺有意思的。Faced with the advancement of the Japanese from the east. As well as pressure from the Guomindang, Rewi settled on the isolated county of Shandan. In late 1943, Rewi and headmaster George Hogg, a British man who'd been running a school which was forced to flee from Shanxi Province, set off from Lanzhou with the first group of 33 refugee students. Their journey would take four days, while I would arrive in just a few hours. First on the high-speed rail, and then an hour's drive by car. Rewi had been trialing his Bailey schools around China since 1940, with varying levels of success. He described them as schools for refugee boys of working class or peasant backgrounds, where training would center around production, with only a secondary emphasis on classroom work. Rewi described Shandan as the poorest place he'd come across in his travels across China, but he said it had a special air about it. My only impression of Shandan was from Rewi's books, so it's fair to say it was nothing like I'd imagined. When the school was first set up in 1943, Shandan had a population of just 30,000. Today, while still quite remote, this place has international hotels, malls, apartment complexes as far as the eye can see, and is home to some 200,000. 对对对，这样。哎，对了，看一下，觉得好看吗？<laughs> My first stop, the Rewi Alley Memorial Hall. Which offers an extensive look at Rewi's entire life and gives a hint at the impact he made on China in his 60 years here. Right next to the Rewi Alley Memorial Museum is a museum featuring his collection of thousands of historical artifacts collected across China throughout his life. An invaluable resource highlighting this country's extensive history. Just a few hundred meters from the museum is the Shandan Bailey School of Gansu Province, with over 2,000 students. Upon entering, I was awestruck by this huge statue of Rewi, a fellow New Zealander, 
shadowing over the courtyard. I'm here to see Liu Guozhong, an English teacher at the school and a Rewi scholar. Liu Lao Shi has been teaching here for 30 years. Uh for characters, Chuang Zhao Feng Feng Xi, which means create and analyze, because we wanted those kids there to grow up, uh, able to create, able to analyze. You had to arm those kids so they were able to do things. If you didn't arm them with technique, then they wouldn't be able to do anything. They could only talk, and talk gets you nowhere. Across town, a replica of the Fa Ta Si Temple, where the school was first located, stands next to a popular park. Just near the temple, another place of significance, the tombs of Rewi Ali and George Hogg, who tragically died in 1945, forcing Rewi to take over as headmaster. Hey, 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 Jiang Youyu is now the caretaker, regaling visitors with stories of the two foreigners who he remembers seeing with his own eyes as a child. Some of Rewi's ashes are kept here so that the people of Shandan have somewhere to come and see him. After Hogg died, Rewi admits to feeling a deep loneliness. A loneliness that was only softened by the brightness of his students. He would visit this place numerous times in the next four decades. Just around the corner is the site of the Rewi Ali Library, still the only library in town. It first started off with books donated by Rewi himself. Dewey wrote nearly 70 books during his later life, many of which can be found here. 
拼搏精神，在这种那种艰苦的环境中，那环境中的那种拼搏精神啊，非常值得我们今天让我们学习。At the library, I met up with Zhao Qianxi, a researcher at the Dewi Ali Memorial Hall. He offered to take me to a place most people don't know about: the site of a temporary underground Baili school, set up at the threat of attack from the Kuomintang. It's a good drive out of town, chosen because of the clear view of Shandan, which promised plenty of warning if troops were on the way. In the 48 years, they built a mill here. Ah, ah. There was a student, uh, a big student, who worked in the mill. Small students came here to work on Sunday. Ah, we built this spot. Uh, five to six students. Um, we built the wall on the wall. Is the wall? Ah, the wall can be used. Ah, the wall. 尼克西 took me up a hill where Rewi's quarters were, and where the students continued making pottery and bricks, some of which can be found today. This is teaching the students to make their own pottery. Wow! Before, there were many people who came and took it. We don't let them take it. Ah, just put things in the pot. I felt a little bit like Rewi himself as I carefully dug up artifacts left by him and his students. I bet he never realised, while finding cultural relics himself, that I'd be here decades later finding traces of history he left behind. Liberation came to Shandan on September 19, 1949. As the PLA rolled into town and Kuomintang soldiers fled, as the PLA uh, came breaking through uh, the uh, mountains, the Chilean mountains to our south, and uh, next morning we were left、uh, waiting liberation. Rewi stayed on as headmaster at the school until 1953, when the government requested he move here. To the International Friendship Association in Beijing, where he spent the remaining three decades of his life promoting world peace and international cooperation. After my journey learning about Rewi Ali, I feel like I finally understand what drove him to spend 60 years of his life devoted to helping China and the Chinese people. I've definitely adopted his spirit and hope to continue his legacy, helping the world better understand China and her people through my work. Something that's perhaps more important now than ever before. Rewi's legacy also lives on through the countless students thoroughly studying his life. I'm sure if Rewi were here right now, he'd be smiling from ear to ear. Myself, I have always been a learner, and I will continue being a learner all the way through.、Uh, just an ordinary person, an ordinary、uh, New Zealand country bumpkin, more or less, and、uh, there we are.
，爱你，爱你，爷爷，谢谢你。